Good afternoon, everyone. I'm Pamela Hastings, hey. Relationship Manager at Barometer Capital. And uh, today we're going to provide you a very um, detailed ma a macro overview of the market. Joining us today is, of course, David Burroughs, our Chief Investment Strategist and President here at Barometer. And two special guests, we have Portfolio Manager Jim Shitakis, who is running our uh, U.S. dividend growth strategies. Uh, the balance pool uh, in conjunction with um, with Greg and David Burroughs and as well making those decisions on companies requires a lot of effort and lots of meetings with management uh, we are just uh, I guess wrapping up earnings season um, and uh, Brian McNichol joins us live from his analyst desk in Toronto so welcome Jim welcome Brian we're so pleased to have you here and uh, of course, we would be pleased to address uh, questions at the end of this conversation. You can email me phastings at barometercapital.ca or uh, hit me up on the chat in the uh, Zoom question uh, link and I would be pleased to address your questions at the tail end of the conversation. So with that, a very exciting day in Bitcoin. Dave, I'm sure you'll talk about that with Coinbase going public. I turn the conversation over to David Burroughs. Good afternoon, David. Hey, Pam. Thanks. Thanks so much for, for kicking things off today and super happy to have uh, Brian uh, with us. Actually, it shows we have two Brian's on the phone on the on the line today. Jim is uh, is a, trying to imitate Brian today, but uh, having Jim Skatakis and, and uh, Brian on the call is, is a great, great addition. Um, just uh, what I thought I'd do today is, is just quickly run through our key themes. There's been a fair bit of data over the course of the week, and so we're always interested in, in having new information uh, to go into the mix to, to help us see whether our theses are playing out or not, uh, and, uh, and to help us make decisions as to whether we need to make changes in the portfolios. Baseline's, baseline premise has been we are in a structural bull market that kicked off way back in 2013 when we exceeded the highs from the year 2000. Uh, that was the end of a structural bear market in stocks, much like this bear market that ran from 1966 to 1982. And once you've gone through one of those periods, uh, there's a lot of skeptics and every little wiggle brings out the bears. Uh, but the reality is structural bear markets last 13, 15, 18 years. Uh, and we are sort of seven years in, uh, and not to say there aren't interruptions, uh, but it's more like sort of four steps forward, one step back. Um, we also have had the view that we are going through a generational bottoming in long-term interest rates, much like we did in the late 1940s, early 1950s. And that has significant implications for kind of what works from an investing standpoint going forward, what works in rising rates is not necessarily what works in a disinflationary environment where rates are falling. Uh, so we've been positioning for that. Uh, and we've also had a view that we were going through a structural bottom in the commodity market that again had significant implications for various markets uh, and various sectors uh, in the, and positioning of course as well. So the beat goes on in equities. US equities have slowly been working their way higher since 2013. We are sort of at the top end of the channel, uh, but you can see in a structural bull market, you can get to a point where actually the channel steepens and that's what happened through the 1990s. So it may well be we are getting toward one of those inflection points, uh, but certainly uh, the, the signaling has been quite positive on a, from a short-term perspective, post the little wiggle we had in September, October, uh, post the election, uh, US equity markets have been very strong and consistent in a very tight price pattern with little small pullbacks along the way. Interesting, we have been seeing pullbacks kind of at month end because equities have so outperformed fixed income that there's been lots of rebalancing to do at the end of each month for those that have to have a fixed allocation between stocks and bonds. We talked about that happening at the end of the March quarter, and we did see some of that coming into the end of the end of the quarter, but actually really not very much considering that there was a little over $300 billion worth of equities that needed to be sold to be moved into, into bonds, which have been such an underperforming asset. That's of course not what we're doing, uh, but that has been the strategy that, that many have had to employ. And you know, the S&P has ticked higher since then. 
Uh, other key theme is, is you know, rising long-term interest rates means that bond prices have been falling, making them a pretty unattractive asset to own. They've had little bumps along the way at, at the end of various months where they had, they had got a little extra buying for rebalancing. We certainly had rebalancing coming into the end of the end of the quarter. And it may be that this very sharp move lower in price in long-term bonds could moderate a bit or correct. Uh, I don't think that that changes the picture in any way, but certainly it has taken the pressure off of things that don't like to see sharp rises in interest rates. The US dollar, uh, has been working its way lower since last April. That, in effect, is, is investors uh, taking safe haven U.S. dollars and deciding to deploy them in more productive assets, things that maybe uh, are more protected from, from, uh, from dilution. You know, there have been a tremendous amount of U.S. dollars printed over the last year. And uh, that just dilutes the value of, of the currency. And, and there, on the other hand, have been opportunities to take dollars and make invest investments in productive assets that would be protected in the event we are going through sort of a reflation or ultimately if we were to see some inflation. Now, after the U.S. dollar had a little bounce early in the year, over the last couple of weeks, U.S. dollar has been backing off again again, supporting those types of assets that do well with a weaker US dollar. So Pam alluded to it. Um, certainly, uh, we've had a little bit of a bounce in Bitcoin. Now, there are always the macro themes and there are more micro or seasonal issues that we deal with. Sometimes there is confluence. And you can see that historically, the US dollar strengthens early in the year and then weakens through into the fall. We certainly have started that kind of with a bang over the last couple of weeks. We'll see whether that continues. But if that seasonal theme were to continue, that is certainly supportive of the investment sectors that we're focused in. So one of the things people have been using to hedge themselves against paper currency is Bitcoin. And we know that yesterday Bitcoin went on to make another new all-time high. A lot of the assets that we've been focused in, weak US dollar assets, had a period of, of sort of consolidation through March and into April. And things get ahead of themselves and need to correct. Things either correct in time by going sideways or in price by pulling back a little bit. We got a little bit of both in Bitcoin, just like we did uh, uh, in the late part of February and in the early part of the year. But we've had a very orderly series of higher highs and higher lows, higher highs and higher lows. And again, Bitcoin making another new high, sort of reaffirming that upward uh, price trend that's in place. Of course, in our global macro portfolio, we have about a 5% weight in Bitcoin and about a 5% weight in Ethereum, uh, another uh, cryptocurrency. And these are just one, one of the tools that we're using to try and take advantage of the current, current environment. Now let's talk about uh, data that's come out over the week, whether it is supportive of our views uh, or, in, or in opposition. Our basic view is that we are headed into sort of year one of a new economic cycle as we come out of COVID, uh, that uh, the Fed is likely to be quite supportive uh, going forward until we get back to pre-COVID employment levels. And that in that case, we want to own uh, companies and investment themes that benefit from a strengthening economy, things that are more economically sensitive. So uh, from an employment standpoint, the last jobs report, just over 940,000 new jobs uh, came in well ahead of S estimate. Uh, and that's great. But what's interesting is that job postings are exceeding what we were seeing prior to the pandemic. In other words, these are jobs that are open and available, should they be able to be filled. And we're seeing quite a significant pickup in new job postings as the economy starts to strengthen. Now, we know that Biden passed a $1.4 trillion stimulus bill about the 9th of March, about $300 billion US found its way into bank accounts in the month of March. It kicked off uh, a reacceleration, certainly in retail sales, uh, and you can see that um, uh, based on certain high frequency data series, you can see that, for instance, in this case, credit card data is showing a big pickup that took place 
in the month of March, we're likely to see that feed through into the Census Bureau data on retail sales. So retail sales certainly picking up. When we look at high frequency data around leisure, open table seated dining reservations actually in the South, which is of course a little bit more progressive than certain other parts of the country, uh, right back to uh, pre-pandemic levels. The rest of the country still sort of uh, on average about 18% below where things were in 2019, but you can see the trajectory certainly moving higher, better ac economic activity there. Mobility trends in the US, uh, this is requests for routing data, uh, for walking and for driving and for transit, certainly going in the right direction, that is accelerating. <clears throat> and then we look at the various places that people spend their money from a consumer discretionary standpoint. Uh, we look at the levels in 2020 and the relative levels today, certainly department store spending well up, home improvement well up, clothing well up, furniture well up, grocery up, restaurants about even, still lots to have happen here in lodging and airlines, uh, but we are likely to see that start to improve as, uh, as the, the, uh, the reopening takes place. And interesting enough, it's creating a little bit of at least short-term inflation in prices, 2.6% in urban, in urban centers. And if we were to add back the decline in recreation services, certainly that's going to have an impact on, on CPI as well. So all of these things do point to sort of reflation in the economy, reacceleration, improvement in economic activity, uh, and we'll see whether this gets supported in our themes. So I always like to go back and look at the key leadership themes that our work has pointed us to, to say, is the market doing what we think it should be doing, given the things that we know? And so let's take a look at that. We talked in the late part of the quarter that we might see a little bit of turbulence in some of the themes coming through quarter end rebalancing. This is a chart of cyclical securities versus more defensive securities, economically sensitive versus more defensive, more like bonds. And we know that since uh, the middle of last year, the cyclicals have way outperformed the defensive equities. We've seen a little bit of consolidation take place there. You can see a little bit of reacceleration recently. And similarly, you know, plotted against the rise in the yield of the 10 year bond. So let's look at those themes. In general, value, this is an ETF that looks at the value securities within the S&P 500, more economically sensitive, have been outperforming the S&P. You can see pulled back a little bit through the middle of March and making a turn higher. Now, <clears throat> probably uh, the, the poster child for value, which is um, uh, securities that have a lower multiple, uh, are more economically sensitive and probably less well-owned, is the financials. And we talked about the fact that the financials in February of this year, the XLF index finally made its first new high since 2007. So we talked about structural bear markets, that's the structural bear market. Uh, 14 years without making a new high, of course did make a new high, pulled back a little bit in the late part of April, sorry, March, but now moving to the upside. And a big part of the financial sector or the banks. And this is the bank ETF. You can see, again, pulled back a little bit uh, uh, in the late part of March and moving a little higher. And here we are now at the next sort of major catalyst where we're entering earnings season. The banks are always early to report. So I thought maybe I'd ask Jim Skatakis to join us today and talk a little bit about what he's looking for from this group and to talk a little bit about what he thinks are the catalysts that are going to drive these going forward. Jim, are you there? I'm, uh, I'm listening, Dave. <laughs> <laughs> uh, <clears throat> thanks, Dave. Uh, you know, we're at the beginning of earnings season. Um, uh, as Dave mentioned, the banks do start off uh, reporting early. And, you know, uh, it's, a, it's a funny time this, uh, this year because we're uh, anniversarying the first quarter of, uh, of 20, and that was partially affected by, uh, by the... Uh, uh, COVID uh, crisis. Uh, so uh, what happened was a lot of the banks took, um, uh, were being prudent and took charge-offs and saying, we're not, 
not charge-offs, but provisions, uh, saying that we don't know what's going to happen, so we're going to be uh, conservative and take provisions uh, for potential loan losses. As it happens, the, uh, the governments around the world, uh, and, in, and notably in the U.S., came out uh, pretty uh, aggressively and uh, reflated everybody so that, uh, <clears throat> so that uh, corporates could go out and borrow and, uh, uh, and, and, not, uh, <clears throat> uh, and not cause any uh, credit uh, issues. So, <clears throat> so what we're looking for on these earnings releases is the amount of uh, reserves that will be uh, released back and put back into earnings. They were taken out of earnings in Q1 2020. They've got to be put back in. So that's one of the uh, issues we're looking at. Uh, the other is that uh, many of the larger banks, uh, because the system is awash in liquidity, uh, they can't uh, find enough loans to make. So what? So what are they going to do with their excess capital? Are they going to increase dividend? Are they going to uh, buy back shares? Are they going to make uh, acquisitions? So those are the kinds of things we're looking at. Uh, and uh, as it happens, we've had um, you know the biggest bank, uh, J.P. Morgan, uh, announced uh, <clears throat> earnings earlier this morning, and uh, you know they had revenue up fourteen percent year over year. You know uh, earnings is muddled because because of that uh, uh, reserve. Um, so earnings are a bit messy and uh, they were up 100%. But some of that is from uh, reserve releases. But the revenue number is still pretty solid. 14% uh, revenue growth for the largest bank in the world. That's, uh, that's pretty robust. Uh, mm. Now, Jim, I know that you've been focusing a lot on the banks that have been able to grow their loans. Um, did First Republic report today? Uh, they reported as well. And uh, thanks for uh, thanks for the segue, Dave. Uh, <laughs> so, uh, <clears throat> so what uh, First Republic had revenue growth of 24%. It's a much smaller bank. Uh, you're looking at a $30 billion bank versus a $400 billion bank. So they had 24% revenue growth, earnings growth of 50%, but they had loan growth of 24%. Uh, JP Morgan had loan growth of minus 4%. So uh, First Republic has something to do with their capital other than give it back to us, which is- so It's good to have a mix of both. So it's a, uh, and it's it's responsible stewardship that we're looking for from J.P. Morgan to say, okay, we can't make the loans, so we're going to give you back some of the capital. And from First Republic, in in essence, what we're doing is taking the the buybacks from J.P. Morgan, and First Republic comes to us every year for more capital because they're making more loans, yeah. uh, with a uh, an ROE of fourteen uh, percent. It's a great business. Right. Um, so we're excited about having uh, companies like that on our uh, uh, in our portfolio. Yeah. That that's very similar to Silicon Valley Bank Corp. I know in the, in in the same way. It's it's interesting always when you when you look at uh, a sector that's been out of favor for a long period of time. Invariably, there are two or three companies that have figured out how to grow while other people aren't. And in general. Those are the ones that 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 double first, and and those are the ones that kind of double again uh, just as quickly afterwards. So so this is sort of where we've had our our, our bigger bigger focuses. Jim, thanks 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 so much. Um, let's let's keep checking on in in on these themes uh, after a little pullback uh, in late part of the quarter. This is the this is a commodities ETF started to make a nice turn as U.S. dollar started to back off broken this little little downtrend. Uh, and so in various areas, different results. These are the big, big miners uh, have made a very quick turn. A lot of the big miners today, Freeport, McMoran, uh, I know it by about 3.30, it was up a little over 7% on the day. Um, uh, Rio Tinto was up a little over 3% uh, 
Uh, first quantum, I think, was up about six and a half percent. So they look to be reaccelerating. The forest products companies, certainly lumber prices continue to firm up with the housing market being strong, uh, just chugging right on to new highs. Uh, the agriculture sector, you know, trading at trading at new highs. Uh, and after a, a pretty good sized pullback late part of March, when uh, when uh, the energy producers ran into resistance, they've started to make a turn in the last couple of days. So that certainly had a little impact on us in the last month. We do have uh, about uh, had, did have about a ten percent weight uh, in energy, and that certainly pulled things back a little bit. But again, if the whole complex in commodities is working its way higher, highly likely that the uh, energy producers follow along suit. Um, industrials really haven't missed a beat. Uh, they've been they've been led by the transport stocks. We've all heard about backups in logistics systems trying to get goods to market. Certainly, the backup in Suez Canal didn't didn't uh, didn't help. Uh, but this is a key bellwether sector that we watch for expectations on future growth in the economy. You got to move the stuff, uh, and the transport stocks are doing exactly what you would expect. Uh, and the consumer discretionary sector, after a little consolidation through late part of February, early March again, in the last seven or eight days has taken out the highs. And that's that's a combination of areas. That's that's a combination of retail, certainly online retail, a combination of some leisure companies. Uh, we talked uh, about the home builders and how they have made their first new high in several years. Again, a new bull market in, in home builders. Uh, we talked about the uh, recreational vehicles. This is the portion of Bombardier that makes Sea-Doo's and Skidoo's hard to buy those these days, <clears throat> and and as I mentioned, the home builders you know have just taken out highs that go back to 2004, and so this is again coming out of a coming out of a bear market, and uh, and then there's the auto group, and we're going to talk a little bit about autos today. Uh, we do have uh, a couple of positions in the large uh, manufacturers which have been performing quite well, but certainly it's not been lost on the parts companies and the sub-assembly companies that demand is strong. In the third week of March, uh, the industry reported 17.7 million car annual uh, rate of uh, manufacturing. That's the best uh, level we've seen since 2017. So certainly the consumer is in gear. Uh, and one of our very biggest positions in the firm uh, is in Magna, and Magna really uh, is uh, is picking up not just on an absolute basis, but relative to its peers. So I've asked Brian McNichol to come on and talk a little bit about why it is that we have such a big position in Magna and what we see as the opportunity. Brian? Yeah, perfect. Thanks, Dave. Um, so, I mean, this name has seen tremendous growth in their multiple, as you can see on the chart on the screen. Um, investors continue to rotate funds into Magna, mainly just given their focus and ongoing investments into the key megatrends that we've seen within the auto space, most notably the, uh, the move around electrification. So currently 90% of Magna's portfolio is relevant to both to EVs and the uh, ongoing method right now, which is the internal combustion engines, which puts them far ahead of their peers. I think their closest peer would be Martin Rea within Canada at about 75%, and then Linamar well below that. Um, the strength of their portfolio was definitely highlighted by the recent $1 billion JV that they signed with LG to manufacture a suite of products uh, and, you know, for certain automakers that are focusing on this trend. And then it's also, it's worth mentioning that Apple is looking for a manufacturer to partner with for their concept car. And there have been no short um, number of discussions out there and um, that, that we believe Apple will actually be looking, for, looking towards this newly formed JV as their partner. And we think that if Apple were to pick the, pick the LG Magna partnership, apologies, um, then we could see a massive inflow of other types of uh, similar contracts flowing their way. So that would Magna be a lot, Brian, like, like sort of the relationship Foxconn has with Apple? Exactly. Yeah. Exactly. Yeah. Um, so Magna is currently sitting with a very solid balance sheet relative to their peers. Uh, debt is very minimal. And the company has a very strong legacy portfolio that generates significant cash flow to help fund these investments. So over the past three years, Magna generated roughly 5.8 billion in free cash flow. And over the next three years, they expect to generate another six. So roughly 35 to 40% of that future free cash flow generation, they plan to put towards share buybacks with the remainder going to dividends, strategic M&A, 
and further investments in these mega trends. They also have a great management team um, and they've been executing at a very high level, especially through COVID. And, and the company should be poised for a pretty strong year uh, as we enter into a, a ramp up of this global, um, this global auto industry recovery. Right That's now though, what we're, sorry, go ahead, Dave. Go ahead. Go ahead. I'd say right now, what we're looking for for the upcoming quarter is there have been some hiccups uh, in terms of a global shortage of semiconductor, um, sem semiconductor chips. And what we'll be looking for from management, uh, both from Magna as well as the rest of the space, is just, a re um, just them reaffirming their overall full-year guidance. As we believe any reduction in guidance will definitely mean that the, the, the shortfall on the chips that we've seen globally has been larger than feared. But we are very comfortable with the, uh, with the guidance that Magna set up at their last quarter, and we think that they'll be able to hit their numbers. Right. So the reason I like to, to highlight this is – you know, we when when a when a group gets going, and a lot of new eyes turn to a sector and look at the players, there will always be two or three that, for whatever reason, are in the right place at the right time. Generally, because they made good decisions, uh, and and for a long time, Magna traded at a discount to other parts companies, partly maybe because it was Canadian, but the global nature of the business and their focus on on areas that are relevant to electric vehicles you know, puts them sort of squarely into this mega trend. And, and when these things get going, very often people will say, well, now it's expensive, it's moved higher. But when mega trends begin, they can go on for a very long time. So we think that there is a structural a tailwind for this part of the auto market. We think that there's a structural tailwind for consumer discretionary companies in general, globally. Uh, and, uh, and with their superior sort of financial metrics, uh, it plays into one of our most important themes, which is dividend growth. And Brian, what do you think, um, just talk a little bit about the history of dividend growth at Magna and what you think some of these things could mean for dividend growth going forward. Yes, sure. So, I mean, over the past few years, Magna has been able to grow their dividend anywhere between seven and a half to 10%. Um, they did raise their dividend right at the beginning of the pandemic and despite all the global uh, issues regarding their industry and just the global economy slowing down as a whole, um, with each new quarter that came out, they were able to stand pat on their dividend. And then this past quarter actually raised it with, uh, with a massive free cash flow number that came in as well. So we really think that they're, they have a very savvy management team uh, that should be able to continue to grow dividend at this, at this clip. I think the only hiccup that would be associated with them reducing dividend growth is if we see a large scale acquisition or more focused towards share buybacks. But again, those would be an acquisition would be an eye to, to, to accelerating growth, not decelerating. Exactly. Yes. It, yeah. it would be, it would be towards a company that has similar uh, exposure in the EV market or towards different types of technology to help them expand theirs. Great. Brian, thanks so much for joining us today. Yeah, of course. Thank you. Um, so that brings us to, to what we think is one of the most important themes that investors are going to need to focus in, and that is, as opposed to focusing on companies with the highest dividends, let's find companies with, with a reasonable dividend, but one that is growing faster than the average. The dividend growth theme is outperforming the S&P 500 this year, and dividend growers tend to have lower volatility. So this is where we've been focusing our income strategy. We've been preparing for this uh, shift in interest rate regime uh, for about 18 months, and we think this can go on for a very long time. We talked a little bit about technology underperforming through the month of March. We thought that was more a uh, correction than, than something bigger. Uh, they have reaccelerated over the last couple of weeks. This is the QQQ ETF, which is the 100 largest technology companies. Certainly companies like Microsoft, again, a dividend growth stock, and Google, similar, uh, quite strong. These are both very large holdings for us. Um, just stepping outside of the US for a minute, we talked about how international stocks a little bit later to exit a sec secular bear market while the US started a new bull market in 2013. Taiwan just broke out of a 20 year bear market in July of last year, certainly. That is continuing higher, very strong over the last couple of weeks. Uh, Korea, very similar, moved higher, consolidated, now, now stepping higher again. Much of Asia looks the same. Uh, and importantly, speaking of new bull markets, 
There's the Euro stock 600 monthly chart going back to just the late part of the 1990s, again, finally breaking out. So when we talk about breadth, the idea within a sector or within a market is that more and more security should participate in a rally in a healthy environment. And clearly the flow of assets into the equity asset class is buoying ships around the world. And the Euro uh, markets could do quite well because when we look at the makeup of, uh, of the European markets, larger from an industrial's perspective, larger weight from materials, a larger weight from financials. So if the currency can be resilient, uh, this could be a, a, a good place to be looking to add. So going back to our discipline, our job is to do three things. Use the tools that we have to identify clear market leadership, structural themes that could, it could go on for a long time with the tailwind and focus in those areas. We're always watching for new leadership to emerge like some of these global markets, which in our macro portfolio, 15, 16% is emerging markets, just over 20% is global, uh, global developed markets. Uh, so that's been sort of relatively new um, uh, holdings over the last few months. And then of course, if things get sloppy, be prepared to play defense. As it sits right now, our key indicators are positive. Our global breadth model is positive, meaning more and more companies are participating in the rally. Our US equity breadth model is positive. Our key short-term indicators are basically positive. Uh, and so, the backdrop we think is, is, is a positive one. From a flow perspective, meaning where is the money going? We hear about all this money flowing into equities. These are 12 month flows. Actually equity flows have only just turned positive after turning down in 2018. And while we talk about the fact that we think bonds are going through a topping process, there's still been a ton of money moved into the bond market. It may be starting to come out, but it's early days. And then look at this, this is money market funds. So yes, tons of money into money market early in the year. A lot of money still stuck there. This is fuel that along with stimulus money can find its way further into equity markets uh, and move valuations higher. Volatility continues to fall. That is the market's measurement of expectation for volatility going forward. And credit spreads are the excess return that bond investors are demanding to buy a corporate bond versus a government bond has been falling, meaning they are comfortable with credit risk. So all of these things tell us that we think likely market is in good shape. Are there things to worry about? Well, always there are, we worry every day. Sentiment is pretty strong. People are feeling fairly confident. We have to keep an eye on that. We are in the quiet period before earnings releases, which means that share buybacks by big corporations are now on the sidelines until they report their earnings. But we're going to get a lot of news over the next couple of weeks, and that's going to help us again to reassess our key themes to make sure that what we think should be happening is happening. What I know is that since November, when this these themes really got going, the bond market has not been a place to be and we have virtually no bond exposure. The S&P 500 has been working its way higher, but there has been dispersion in the returns from various groups. The bond proxies, things that act like bonds have way underperformed, and the things that are more economically sensitive have done better. So VIS is an industrials ETF. PICK is a mining ETF. FXD is a consumer discretionary ETF. XLF is the financials ETF. And while the energy stocks have certainly pulled back over the last couple of months, uh, that's a correction in a move higher, I believe, and they are outperforming. So we want to have weight there. So from a weightings perspective, financials are our biggest weight, moving a little bit higher this week, over a month ago, well out uh, uh, in, in uh, excess of the S&P financials weight. Industrials are our next biggest weight. Technology, we bumped up as technology started to do a little better in the last couple of weeks. Energy is a large weight. Materials are a large weight, consumer discretionary, and considerably underweight the various bond proxies. So unless we see 
changes to our themes, this is likely where we remain in the short run. We watch every day for signs of, of trouble. And should that take place, you know, we certainly will not hesitate to get defensive. Historically, in big market sell-offs, we've been pretty good at playing defense versus what's happened in the market. But at this point, I don't think that that is sort of in the cards. So with that, Pamela, if there's any questions, certainly happy to take them. Thanks so much, Dave. Um, this question comes from Paul in Toronto. In your past presentations, David, you indicated the portfolios were reducing large cap tech. Are you investing again, given the pullback? Great question. So if, you, if we go back to that screen, you can see that as of a month ago, we were down at 7%. Now, if, you, if you've been on these calls, you'll know that through much of last year, we were over 30% technology. So through the early part of this year, we reduced our weight and we did take the weight back up. We're still in a significant underweight position because we think that the technology companies in general, and this is generalizing, are less economically sensitive than say the industrials or materials or consumer discretionary companies. There are some certainly that are more economically sensitive like the semiconductor manufacturers. We own Micron Technologies. Uh, and, and when we look at spending expectations for this upcoming year, we just went through a survey that showed CEOs expect to spend 4% more this year uh, on, uh, on technology than they did last year, focusing in software. So, you know, Microsoft should be a beneficiary there. Google should be a beneficiary there in their cloud business. So we moved it a little, little bit higher, but we still are fairways underweight. We think that risk reward favors things like financials that not only are much less expensive, but are, have a way under owned relative to technology. Uh, they're still not a well-loved group. Thanks so much, Dave. Uh, next question, um, Kathy Woods, who I'm sure you're familiar with, uh, ARK Investments, she has some wild predictions on Shopify, Tesla, et cetera. Love to get your thoughts on, on those predictions. Sure, um, so let me see if I can put up another screen here. Um, let's see, oh, here we go. Um, I'm going to share Safari and let's do this. ARKK. So, um, Pam, can you see my screen okay? Yes, I can, Dave. Thank okay. You. So, this is an ETF that is run by uh, uh, Kathy Woods and the folks at ARK that invests in the highest growth. Uh, mid-sized technology companies. It's the ARC Innovation ETF. Uh, and, you know, you can see why we may have wanted to reduce some weighting in technology. This ETF fell from $160 to $110 over the course of two weeks. So this is made up of largely companies that have less revenue and certainly very little earnings, but lots of future promise. And so, you know, they're trying to kind of make a bottom here in the short run, uh, but uh, companies that have very high multiples, meaning that you're paying for the future way out, um, can be more susceptible to higher rates. And so uh, this is a group that has pulled back quite substantially, but certainly getting a little better over the last week. Well, that's great, Dave. Um you know, we did have a question and it's fairly detailed the answer I would expect because um, obviously our investors, when we meet with them, we, we tailor strategy specific to their individual solutions. So, but we did have a question if you could briefly walk through um, our pool offerings, what we offer to investors. We, you mentioned the income pool. Sure. Um, maybe you could just briefly talk to our investors and prospective investors about the different types of pools that we offer and like how you sure. would come at risk. So, so historically speaking, Pam, as you know, we, we ran separately managed accounts for each client where we built a mandate uh, and set up a portfolio of, of, of single stock holdings, uh, 20 to 40 positions. And we still run a lot of our client portfolios that way. Along the way, we found uh, some efficiencies in running a pool that would be shared by a number of investors like a fund. Uh, and so we run five pools, uh, each one with a different 
um, different purpose. So of course we run a go anywhere equity pool. We try to keep our mandates as flexible as possible because as you know, leadership in the market changes. And so our equity portfolio can be anywhere geographically. It can be any mix of uh, industries and various weights. It can hold an unlimited cash weight uh, in the event that we get into a tough market, which is what's helped us defend ourselves in some, some long-term bear markets. Um, but it's 20 to 40 positions. Um, we we complement that with an income portfolio. And the income portfolio can be in any kind of income security. And there have been times when it's been focused in bonds. Uh, there's been corporate bonds, been preferred shares, a mix of, of those along with cash. Um, and dividend paying common shares, which is where we are focused today because we think that the bond market does not pose a uh, very good risk reward. You know, the, the TLT, the 30 year US bond fell from $179 to $135. And yes, you get your 1% coupon, but that's, that's, that's not much solace. So we have very little by way of fixed income exposure there, but that's a, meant to be a conservative income producing portfolio. We run a balanced portfolio, which is a mix of equities and bonds, uh, which will always have a minimum of 25% fixed income. Uh, we have a long short portfolio, which is largely equities and largely smaller and mid-sized companies. And we can be long uh, the companies that we want to be invested in, or we can take advantage of what we think are weak companies by short selling them. Uh, we don't tend to have a lot of shorts uh, in those portfolios during a bull market because it's tough to make money shorting in a bull market. And then we have our global portfolio and the global macro portfolio is a portfolio aimed at taking advantage of these large structural themes, both long or short, across any kind of asset class. So equities, various areas of fixed income, which we've been short largely over the last six months, um, emerging markets, um, other developed markets, commodities, real estate, and that's meant to be a diversifier, uh, that portfolio. So we generally will build a mix of those pools uh, based on what the client's trying to get accomplished. And then we, of course, revisit it on a regular basis when we review with them. Well, that's great. Thank you so much for the uh, clarification, Dave. And of course, I know you're very busy walking through quarterly reviews with clients. So if any of our current clients out there are looking for a review, um, don't hesitate to reach out to any one of our fantastic relationship managers. Um, and on that note, David, I'll leave you with the final word. We don't have any further questions. And I just want to say thank you to Brian and Jim for joining us this afternoon. It, it is great to have guests. And it's great to have uh, you all on the line with us. Um, as a reminder, we send this out as a recorded uh, uh, call tomorrow. Uh, and if you have any questions that you'd like us to, to answer or tackle in a future webcast, please send them in to us. If you'd like to have a conversation uh, about uh, uh, further on any of the topics that we've been talking about, I'm certainly happy to jump on the line at any given point in time. And our counselors would love to talk to you as well. So thanks very much for sharing uh, 40 minutes with us. And we look forward to seeing a lot of you again next week. Have a good week.